Hello, my wonderful AP World History students. Hey, Fardeen, welcome in. Welcome, welcome to the amazing review, Race to a Five. We are on Units 4 and Unit 5 tonight. Isn't it exciting? Ah, it's so exciting. Oh, man, we've been studying so hard this year. I'm so proud of you guys. Keep it up. We're almost to the finish line. Uh, so in the description below, I have all of the links that you're going to need, but, oh, I guess it's not going to let me share that one. Or, I mean, it's not going to let me, um, I guess I need to sign in. I'm going to put it in the chat as well. This is the first one I'm going to go over just real quick. This is the one that has your assignment in it. Let's see what I, okay, that's probably why. All right, uh, so this is going to be your assignment for the Amazing Race Unit 4 and Unit 5. I have not checked the uh, Amazing Race for Units 1 through 4, or 1 through 3 yet, 0 through 3, sorry. Uh, but I'll do that this weekend, and hopefully by next week I'll have the, the tallies of who's in the lead as far as points go. If you are doing this and you're not in my class, make sure that you send yours to this email address right here so that you can get in on the competition as well. I think there's a couple that are following from Instagram, so we're happy to have you in here. Just make sure that I get your uh, work so that I can tally you in the points. So this week, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go over this real quickly and then we're gonna talk about a DBQ and go over some examples of that. So unit four, you're going to be looking at the video and then and taking notes, and then the DBQ practice, which is what we're doing tonight, and then context. These are the three things that I'm going to grade. The rest of this is extra credit as well as extra points. And then all the way at the bottom, you see unit five. These are the other two things that I'm going to grade. We're not going to do a DBQ over unit five, but I do have one. If you want to practice, just let me know and I will send it to you. And then uh, here's like your reading questions and all that kind of stuff. So most of that should be in your notebook if you did it back when we did unit four and five. And that's the things that are going to be graded from Unit 4 and 5. So just the orange stuff, the rest of it is extra points and extra credit. Tonight, what we're going to do is look at a DBQ from Unit 4. Now, one thing that's super important is that when we take this DBQ on paper, you can notate your paper and you can notate your documents. But you're not going to be able to do that online because it's going to be on your screen. Right. So what I want you to do when it comes to time to take the AP exam and each each one that you practice, you should probably do the same thing so that you get into the habit of it is make yourself a chart, make yourself some kind of format that you can, um, you know, write your notes on as you're going through the DBQ. This is the one that we've been using pretty much all year. You don't necessarily have to use this one, but what I like about this one is that it's very simple. You want to make it as fast and as simple as possible. So you would just draw this on a piece of paper. You would have your document numbers over here. What you're going to argue, you'll put right here. Um, in this case, you'd look at the prompt to see what you're going to argue. And then what would I use to describe this? What would I use to support? And am I going to explain this? Am I going to talk about point of view? Am I going to talk about audience? or um, uh, what's the other one, historical context and I'm not, uh, intended audience purpose. That's the one I'm missing. Um, and so you can put that just right here in this little area. Now this has to be done as fast as possible because remember you only have an hour to write the DBQ. So you wanna give yourself about 15 minutes to look over the documents and get this information. But what's really awesome is that if you get the information and you write it down here, then your DBQ has pretty much written itself. Then you just look at that to pull your information. OK, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Now, the reason I'm showing you this layout is because it's very difficult for me to type in this type of a layout because that you got to put text boxes in and things just don't jive right. So what I did is I made an organizer that looks like this 
which you can also use. And I'm going to give you a copy of this. It's also in the description below. Now, this one is a little bit less simple. I like this better because it's all on one sheet of paper. So it will be easy when you're like planning and you're trying to group your documents and stuff. But this one we're going to use for our purposes tonight. So just know that it's in the same type of layout. Uh, and we're, we're looking at the same information. This is just a more like typing friendly layout for tonight. Also, here is the DBQ that we're going to be using, which is also in the description below. This is a DBQ from last year and last year they only had five documents. So my goal was to find a different DBQ that we could look at tonight. The problem was that I got too busy this week to redo and, and get one ready and everything. And so we're gonna use this one from last year, even though it only has five documents, it's still the same gist, we're still using the same rubric. So you're gonna use the same format, you'll just have less documents. So just know that on the actual exam, you're going to have seven documents. The next one we practice will have that many documents. I was just using this from last year to make it a little bit easier on myself because this week has been crazy. So. In, in a way, it's kind of good because at least this way we can really focus on the documents that we do have. And then next week we'll do it with the actual number that you're going to be doing on the DBQ. Okay. All right. So let's look at our prompt. It says, evaluate the extent to which rulers of the early modern era use similar methods in establishing their authority during the period of 1450 to 1750. So I do want you to participate as much as you can tonight because if you have any questions and uh, you know feedback, things like that, that can be really helpful with these lives because I'm here, I can answer your questions, or at least that's the point, right? Hopefully I can answer your questions. You're not allowed to ask me anything too hard. It has been a long day, uh, but we'll see what we could do. Okay, so with this prompt, evaluate the extent. That just means how significant was it? Okay, how big of a deal was it? Was it minor? Was it major? To which rulers of the early modern era, remember we're in 1450 to 1750, so we have to rewind time from what we've been talking about recently, use similar methods in a stack. Sorry, I don't know why my microphone does that. I can't figure it out. It mutes itself sometimes, so crazy. But at least it gives me a little message so that I don't keep talking. Okay, so anyway, similar methods. Similar is code for comparison. So this is going to be a comparison essay. We're looking for similarities. Now, if you want to try to go for that complex point where you have to do similarity and difference as well, then you can do both similarity and difference, okay? Similar methods in establishing authority. So if I were doing this layout, I would write from what I'm going to argue is methods of establishing authority. And I'm going to, you know, abbreviate as much as possible because remember, you're trying to get this done really quickly. So I know this is my time period. I know I'm comparing and I'm comparing how rulers established authority. What you're going to turn in for your grade for this is the DBQ organizer. So this is what you need to be filling out along with me if you want to split your screen or if you want to watch this on your phone screen, either one that works for you. And we're comparing, so we're going to highlight that. And I think I left that in there. I forgot to delete it from last year, so you're, you're welcome. That's how, <laughs> that's how it goes. All right, and so we're in period 1450 to 1750. Now, we're looking for similarities. We're also looking if there's any differences because we want to do both in order to maybe try to get that, that um, unicorn point that all of you guys are, are really, really wanting. <laughs> <laughs> and it might happen, it might not, but we might as well try for it. Okay, so uh, let's look at our documents. As you're going through the documents, what I want you to look for is what am I going to use to describe this? Like what's the main idea of the document? What can I pull from this document that's going to prove how the rulers establish authority? And am I going to hippo this? Do I uh, have enough information to do audience, point of view, purpose, whatever? Those are the questions you're asking yourself, okay? So document one is a source. A source is from 
Uh, the letter from Ogier Gislin, however you say his name, a Flemish writer and ambassador of the Austrian Empire to the Ottoman court of Suleiman the Magnificent. Now we have to go all the way back in time, right? We're in a different time period than what we're talking about right now. So don't let that confuse you. But this is the court of Solomon the Magnificent. So that means that's when he ruled. And this guy is uh, a Flemish writer. So he's an outsider. He's not from the Austrian Empire. He's coming in as an ambassador. Okay. So he says, Solomon the Magnificent at one time tried persuasion on the shawl, the Safavid shawl, reminding him of the treaty by which he had agreed they should both have the same friends and enemies and at, and add another, I, I think that might be a typo, endeavored to frighten him with menacing language in, threatened, in threatening him with war. He had placed strong garrisons in all his towns on the Persian Safavid frontier and filled Mesopotamia and the banks of the Euphrates with soldiers who were taken for the most part from the Imperial Guard. He also sent frequent messages to the tribes they called the Georgians, urging them to take up arms against the king of Persia. Now, what can you tell me about the main idea of this document? What's going on here? Anybody, anybody, anybody? What would you put down for the main idea of this document to describe it? I'm going to have my phone over here um, because sometimes it pops up faster. What could you say to describe this? You're just looking for the main idea. What's going on? Okay, Ottomans versus the Safavid Empire. Definitely. So remember, the Shia... And the um, Sunnis don't get along. And Ottomans are Sunnis? Yes. And Shia, uh, the, the Safavids are Shia. They don't get along with each other. So Solomon, who is in charge of the Ottoman Empire, is kind of going up against the Safavid Empire. Or the Safavid um, king, or the Safavid shah, sorry. So over here in your organizer... For description, you would put Ottoman, I want to underline it, Ottoman versus the Safavid. They don't get along. Just writing this kid back real quick. Okay, now we have to pull something from this document that is going to show us how rulers established their authority. So how did Solomon establish his authority? If you look at the document, it talks about, um, he says, he endeavored to frighten him with menacing language and threatening him with war. He placed strong garrisons in all his towns on the frontier. So a garrison would be like a fort, and they'd be right on the border of the Safavid and the Ottoman Empire. He filled Mesopotamia and the banks with soldiers. So he's using force, right? So the main topic of this would be that he's using force. I'm going to unbold this too because that's driving me nuts. So using force to uh, impose his authority. And this might be something that we could group our documents by. So I'm going to highlight that just so that that stands out a little bit. And what could I pull from the document and put into my own words to prove that, I would probably use some of this right here about how he's 
trying to frighten him with strong language and threatening war. And he fills the, the bank with soldiers. So you're going to put some of that into your own words. So um, you would say something like, um, he does this by sending soldiers to the banks of the river and setting up forts on the border. Putting it in my own words, he uses threatening language. Let's see, what's another word we could put for threatening? He uses um, forceful language to uh, not accuse, but um, to entice war. Okay, you're just putting that into your own words. That's parts of the document. That would be your supports part. But if you put it in your own words right away, then it's ready to go when you write your DBQ. Yeah, you could say that too, Fardine. Mm -hmm. You could put that in there. Now, the other thing that you have to keep in mind, because you have to do at least once outside evidence. So make a note to yourself. Is there any outside evidence that you know about this? Well, we know that the Ottoman and the Safavid don't get along because of the Shia and Sunni split. So we could maybe talk about that. I would just make a little note to myself that that's what uh, my outside evidence could be. And then that way, when I'm ready to write it, I have that information. Now, let's look at our document real quick. Could we explain this? Could we hippo this? This is a letter from an outsider. He's an ambassador, and he is the ambassador of the Austrian, wait, okay, let's see, ambassador of the Austrian Empire. So he's from Austria to the Ottoman court. He's going to Solomon the Great. And he's talking to Solomon Magnificent one time tried persuasion on the shawl, reminding him of the tree, but he had agreed they should both have the same friends and enemies and endeavored to frighten him. Okay, so what do you think? Could we do audience for this? Who's his audience? His audience would be Solomon. He's an ambassador to Solomon, so he's talking to Solomon. And how does knowing that change the document? He's being, you know, very forceful. Is he being respectful, do you think? Mm -hmm. You're right, Tabena, the audience is Solomon. But how does knowing that the audience is Solomon change the writing of the document? How does it affect the writing of the document? He's Yeah, I, I think so, Fardine. He's being pretty respectful. And he does say at the very beginning, um, at one time, Solomon tried persuasion, reminding the Safavid Shah of the treaty that they had agreed on. But then he had to get a little bit more forceful, right? So he's kind of almost like justifying the way that the that Solomon handled this situation. So remember, that's one of the questions that you need to answer is how that how knowing the audience affects the document. So you put here audience is Solomon. And I don't know. Solomon, I think is how you spell it. Uh, what Tamana says, and he's being respectful because he's the ambassador and he's in front of the Ottoman leader. Yeah. Uh, so respectful uh, because uh, 
So notice that I'm just putting down like the bare minimum over here. Things that are just going to help me remember what I want to say when I write it. You don't have to write in full sentences. You can put bullet points on your notes. You're just doing it as quickly as possible so that you can get through these documents and write your DBQ. I don't think I spelled his name right. Oh, close. Maybe I did. Yeah, I think I did. Okay. All right, we're going to look at document number two. Document number two is an excerpt from James the first speech to English Parliament, 1610. So James is the king, and he's speaking to English Parliament. Hardeen says it changes that. The Ottoman has hated throughout the Persian and land distribution. What do you mean it changes? You mean they, they weren't happy with how, um, with the land that the Persians ended up with? Is that what you mean? Let me know. All right, so we're looking at document number two. The state of monarchy is the supremest thing upon earth. For kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth and sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself, they are called gods. There be three principal comparisons that illustrate the state of monarchy. One taken of the word of God and the two other out of the grounds of policy and philosophy. In the scriptures, God, uh, in the scriptures, kings are called gods. And so their powers after a certain relation compared to the divine power. Kings are also compared to fathers of families for a king is truly parents. Oh, a parents which is a parent of the country. I think that's Latin. The political father of his people. And lastly, kings are compared to the head of the microcosm of the body of man. So what does this sound like? How could we sum this up in a main idea for describes? It's a vocab word from way long ago. Do you remember? Start typing it. Divine right of kings, right? That God sets kings up, and therefore, even if they're a bad king, they still have the right to rule because God set them up. Yes, Tovena, you got it. I just typed a little bit quicker than you. <laughs> but yes, divine right of kings, that's what he's talking about. The king represents God. So what would this be? Uh, how does he establish authority? It would be religion, right? So remember up here, he's using force to impose his authority. Here it would be religion to impose authority. So you want to mark that down too, because this is going to be your groups, maybe, if we can find another one that argues that as well. So what can we use to support that argument? Let's pull something from the doc. So we can say that um, the state of monarchy is the supremest thing on earth, that according to the document, kings are similar to, or not similar, but uh, kings represent God on earth. Let's see where he says that. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, right here. They are not only God's lieutenant upon earth, they sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself, they are called gods. So you can say according to the document, but remember, we're just making it short here. So we could say according to the document, uh, kings are gods on earth, according to scripture. Is there anything else that we could pull? Uh, they are like fathers of the family, like the political parties of the people. Oh, there you go, uh, Farding. So therefore, whatever the king does is right.
So what did I do there? I'm pulling something from the document that's proving that religion was used to impose authority. Now, this one might be a good one to do point of view on because we know James first is a king. What does he believe? He believes that kings are like gods on earth. And why does he believe this? What do you think? I'm going to start saying it, or start putting it down here while you guys are thinking about it. So point of view, you want to make sure and mention those words when you write it. Point of view, James the first is king. He believes that kings are like gods on earth. And... Well, he also believes that kings are set up by gods. Yes, kings are set up by God. But why does he believe that? Do you think he would believe that if he were a peasant? Maybe. Right, his position. He believes this because he's king. He has this point of view because he is king. So, of course, he's going to have that point of view. He doesn't want to lose the power. So, this explains what he believes and why he believes it. And he's explaining it to... The English Parliament as though like he's trying to get them to to believe it too and to be you know like they're Christians too so he wants them to uh, support him and remember that was a way that they got their authority was through this divine right of kings all right let's look at document three Let's see if it there. Okay, this is it. So document three is pretty short. It's Ishmael the first, Shah of Safavid, claims to have descended not only from the seventh Amman, but also to be the incarnation of pre-Islamic kings and prophets. This is one of his poems. Prostrate thyself, which means bow down. Pander not to Satan. Adam has put on new clothes. God has come. Okay. So he's Shaw, which is similar to king or similar to a king. How does he go about enforcing his authority? The same way with religion. So these two documents could be grouped together. What's the main idea here? He's saying um, bow down. So be very humble be, and pander not to Satan. Adam has put on new clothes and God has come. So Adam being the first man, he's likening himself to Adam and that God has come through him. Yes, ideology of, of Islam. Yes. So you could say um, that he, uh, the Shah is showing his um, power through Islamic ideology. Um, and uh, religious belief, maybe? Now, what are we gonna pull from that to support our argument, we could say something like uh, he is telling, let's see, who's the audience? 
uh, in his poem, he's saying, bow down. We don't want to use those same words. Um, maybe humble yourself by bowing before him and understanding that God has come through him to be respectful of God. Yeah. So humble yourself. Bow down. Understand that God. Oh, my goodness. God has come through him. By wearing clothes, God came through him. Uh, well, the, the important part. Yeah, there you go. By wearing new clothes. And it's, it's a symbol, right? It's not necessarily that he's saying, I put on new clothes. He's saying, Adam, the first man, he's likening himself to the first man. Like, so important, right? That he put on new clothes and he and God has come through him. Like, almost like he's been born again. And from the description, we know that he believes he's reincarnated. What does that mean? That he's come back from the dead and is one of, he used to be one of the pre-Islamic kings or prophets. And now he's descended again. So he's, by saying new clothes, he's talking about his reincarnation. Does that make sense? So you could put something like that. Uh, new clothes equal reincarnation. And that makes him even more important because he came from one of the old and old prophets or old kings. Uh, or old kings, yeah. Uh, do we want to explain that one? You could probably do point of view, although it would be very similar to um, the last one that we did. So... Um, what do you guys think? We could probably do purpose. Purpose was to, you know, show his power and to demonstrate his power and demonstrate that he's come from God. You could, you could probably do intended audience too, Tabena. And we could say, um, his intended audience is his subjects. Let's do that one. And then how does that affect the document? He's using um, very powerful language. Uh, to get them to worship him almost in a sense. Hey, coffee. How's it going? Welcome in. Working on the DBQ. You, did you have this last year? I think you had this last year. I, I don't know. The years just kind of all start running together. <laughs> okay. Oops. Got an anonymous buffalo and a leopard. <laughs> you guys made your own copy of this, right? Hopefully you did, because I'm going to delete these out of here. And that way it goes back to... Um, an empty slate for the next person that comes and watches the video. Okay. Uh, yeah. Godly language. Sure. You could talk about that too, Farty. All right. Let's look at document four. Document four is a picture and it's a late 17th century painting by Flemish artist Franz Goffels depicting the 1683 Ottoman siege of Vienna, the last Ottoman incursion into the Austrian empire. So this is, Ottomans trying to go into the Austrian Empire and take land. See ya, Adam. Have a good night. Um, okay, so this would be force, right? Imposes authority by force. Oh, I already had that one on there. You're lucky. Forgot to delete that one. 
going to highlight that. So how could we describe this? It's a picture of the invasion of Austria, Austrian Empire. by the Ottomans. And what could you use out of here to show force? Well, the fact that they are invading shows force. Uh, they're camped all around. It almost looks like they're uh, blockading them or blocking them from getting out, almost like a siege. Conquering of Austria by militarism. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if they used the word militarism for this time frame, but um, you could definitely say like trying to invade them, conquer them using the military. So um, you could say in the picture, it shows the Ottomans. right the first time invading uh, the the land of Austria and um, you could say that like you can see smoke and weapons being used as they're invading Uh, yeah, let's see, Tabena. That might have been different time frame. Let's see when this was. This was earlier in 1554. So I'm assuming that alliance didn't work out because this would be 1683. And it is a siege. So siege means that they're surrounding it and they're not letting anybody go in. So you could use that as well as some evidence. And you could explain that in your writing so that the reader knows that you're that you are um, that you understand what that word means, basically. So I don't know. I'd have to look up some details about that to Benna, but I'm pretty sure that the alliance never went through. And that's why the Ottomans are trying to get into Austria and just take over. Okay, and then this one, to explain this one and do any kind of hippo on it would be really hard because it's a picture, so we're going to skip that one. And uh, let's look at document number five. Document number five is an excerpt from the Sacred Edict of the Qing Dynasty, a set of moral and government instructions enacted by imperial authority, beginning with the Kangxi emperor in 1662 for use in local rituals conducted throughout the Xing empire. Okay. So these are sacred edicts way that they can, um, uh, act that how their morals and their government should be. Okay. So it says number one, esteem most highly filial piety and brotherly submission in order to five due importance to human moral relations. Cultivate peace and concord in your neighborhoods in order to prevent quarrels and litigations. Give importance to agriculture and sericulture in order to ensure a sufficiency of clothing and food. Foster colleges and schools in order to give the training of scholar a proper start. Instruct sons and younger brothers in order to prevent them from doing what is wrong. Promptly remit your taxes in order to avoid being pressed for payment. So what do you think? Which one would this fall into? The use of force or use of religion slash philosophy? I can hear you answering. Definitely religion slash philosophy. What religion slash philosophy was the Qing Dynasty? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. 
So it would be the advice of the Qing Dynasty of how you're supposed to behave, right? It's not advice to the Qing Dynasty, it's from the Qing Dynasty. So that would be a good way to describe it. Advice from the Qing Dynasty of how to behave. Yeah, so Confucianism, right? Influenced by Confucianism. Okay, then we have to pull something from the document that proves that. Give me a minute to get that down. So what could we pull? We could say that uh, filial piety and submission to your brother was very important. So uh, filial piety would be respecting your elders and your family and peace with your neighbors. Also making sure everyone has enough clothing and food. So you could say um, that these were guidelines Actually, that would be described. So um, making sure everyone has enough food and clothing, filial piety, respecting your elders. And... You could say uh, making sure you pay your taxes. That's power from the government, right? They want to make sure that you're going to give them their money. Filial piety means respecting your elders. Nature would be more with Taoism. Guardian. Are you talking about like the nature of a person? Is that what you're talking about? And could we do explains on this one? Well, let's look at it and see. Uh, it's a sacred edict. It's an excerpt from the sacred edict. And it was from the emperor. It was local rituals for the Qing Empire. So we could definitely do audience because we know the audience are going to be the subjects of the Qing. And it's written uh, from the sacred edicts. Yes, for followers of Confucian, that's true, yeah. Uh, so the subjects of the Qing who are followers, so they're going to respect this, right? So it's, it's pretty straightforward. It gives them direct instructions of how to act. Um, and we could say that um, because they are the followers of Confucian, it's using vocabulary that they would know from the sacred edicts. Okay, so for this one, we have five documents. We have two groups. We have religion and philosophy to impose authority, and we have force. So if you're grouping your documents, let me get to my little sheet where I wrote this down. We're going to have documents two, three, and five, 
would be religion slash philosophy. And then uh, one and four would be force. Okay. So how could we write the thesis? Start thinking about that. These are the similarities. So we want to put those in our thesis. And we're going to use the time frame, right? So rulers during the period of 1450 to 1750 established their authority similarly through the use of Justifying their power through religion or philosophy. Or by the use of force. Uh, we need extent language in there, though. So um, to what extent did they do this? What do you think about religion? What extent would religion be? Yes, we're using these documents for the DBQ, Farding. Was religion major or minor? What do you think? I'd say it's pretty major by the way that they're talking. And the force is pretty strong too. So you could say uh, just significantly justifying their power. Significantly justifying their power through religion and philosophy or by use of force. Yep, you could use that as well, major. That would work too. Now, we would normally write a difference too, but we don't really have enough documents with this one to write a difference, so um, we're going to skip that for tonight. But next time, when we write one with, with seven documents, you'll be able to do both. Let's talk about the context, which I also forgot to delete. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> You're so lucky. All right, so for the context, here are some things that you can talk about. At this time frame, gunpowder is spreading from China to the rest of the world, makes it possible for the empire to start, such as makes the Ottoman and the Safavid possible, right? Because they're gunpowder empires. Uh, you can talk about the spread of religion on trade routes and how Islam spread on the Trans-Saharan and the Ottoman Empire taking over Constantinople, changing it to the Islamic religion. You could also discuss the fall of Rome, which leads to Europe needing protection, which leads to feudalism, which leads to the divine right of kings. Now, this one might be good to use for outside evidence, so I would maybe save that for outside evidence. And then um, just talk about uh, this right here, as well as maybe the fact that Rome falls and leads Europe into the feudalism situation. So when you're writing that context and you're putting it into paragraph form, this is what you need in your context. I'm going to highlight that so that you can tell the difference. That's what you need. These are things that you could use. I don't know why I put it there. That's kind of weird. Let me put it up here.
It's like formatted weird too. Okay, there we go. Um, and so then you're going to connect it to your prompt using a sentence. So you would say, um, you know, let's say we're, we're saying gunpowder spreads from China to the rest of the world, making it possible for the Ottoman and the Safavid Empire to exist. During this time, the spread of religions was also taking place on the trade routes. For example, the Trans-Saharan trade route spread Islam and the Ottoman Empire will eventually take over Constantinople, changing the religion to Islam, uh, changing the religion to Islam. Uh, during this a similar time frame, the fall of Rome happens, and this will lead Europe into the need of needing protection, and they will turn to the feudalist system in order to get that protection. So then you have to tie it to the prompt somehow, and you're going to say um, all of this led to the need for emperors to somehow justify their authority. And then you would go into your thesis, which is this up here. Rulers during the period of 1450 to 1750 established their authority similarly through the use of significantly justifying their power through religion and philosophy or by the use of force. Then you'd go into your paragraphs, okay? Uh, we already talked about outside evidence up there. This is the reminders. So you're going to go below those reminders to write your actual um, what are we calling it? Uh, TBQ. <laughs> Gosh, it has been a long week, guys. Okay, so this is my context. So I'm going to put that down here, and I'm going to put that in paragraph form. So just copy and paste that down here. I left it for you. Don't worry about putting it in paragraph form right now. Just know that, like, this is what we talked about with context. And then you're going to grab your thesis and put it down there. What did I do? There we go. Put it down there under context. You're going to um, tie that in to your thesis. So we'd have a tie-in sentence, which would be uh, something like all this led to the need for rulers to establish, um, not establish, I don't want to use establish again, uh, to show their authority or prove their authority, that's better, to prove their authority to their subjects. That ties the context into the thesis. Does that make sense? Then you're going to tear this down and make it into paragraphs. So our first one is the power, uh, justify their power through religion and philosophy. And the second one is by use of force. So our first paragraph, you need to have rulers during the time period of 1450 to 1750. Similarly, uh, justified their power through religion or philosophy in a significant way. So that's what we're arguing. And then you're going to take your documents to argue that. What documents were you using? Two, three, and five. So you go back to your paper. Remember, you're going to have this written down on paper, so it'll be much easier. You won't have to like flip through screens. Here's document two. So you're going to say document two is about the divine right of kings. This document supports that religion was used to impose authority because kings are, because according to the author, kings are gods on earth and 
anything a king does is right. Also, according to the document, the king is the political father of the people and knows what is best and how to lead. That's the supports part. So we're going to say... According to document two, the king has a divine right to rule. That's describing. And then you're going to put in your supports. Um, okay, so the, the document states that kings are gods on earth. And you can use exactly what you wrote because you already put it into your own words. Uh, according to scripture. And therefore, anything the king does is right. The king is all uh, is also the political father of the people and knows what and knows best how to lead. This proves that in Eng in in uh, this proves that some rulers used religion to justify their reign. Remember, that's what we're arguing, right? So this part right here would be your describes. And then this is your supports. Then we need our explains part. What did we say for that? I think we did point of view. Where's that? Right here. So you can say James the first is king of England at the time of the speech. I'm going to say it's King of England and gives this speech to Parliament from the point of view of a king. He believes that kings are like gods on earth. And kings are set up by God. He believes this because he is king and he wants to keep his power. We could also do audience for this one because his audience is the parliament and they're Christians as well. So because he's speaking to other Christians, he knows that if he talks about the importance of the divine right of kings, that they will support him, right? And that's why he talks about it in such a powerful way in his speech. So we could say uh, the audience of this document Parliament and they are Christians, which is why the king uses Christian language that they would know in order to gain their support. 
Now we have two hippos done. Now we have document three. Am I going too fast for you guys? Are you able to get this? I guess I could put it in the chat. I'll put this one in the chat. Make sure that you get it. Okay, let's look at document three. Document three is about religion imposing authority. This is one is from the shawl. Um, and so I'm just going to put this down here so that we can remind ourselves. We don't get to flip back. This is why it's important that you write this down so that you're not flipping through your screens. Plus, I don't think that you're going to be able to flip through screens anyway on the AP exam. So you'll have to write it on paper. It'll be faster anyway, which is good. We got to be as fast as possible, right? All right. So uh, similarly, similarly, in the Safavid Empire, the shawl illustrates his power through Islamic ideology and religious belief. That's the description. This is the supports. He asked the people to humble themselves and bow down to him. He wants he wants them to understand that he is uh, a reincarnation of God. Because he says he is Adam with new clothes. Um, blah, 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 blah. The fact that he is a reincarnation of a old of an old prophet. Or king makes him even more powerful. And grants his authority through religious claim. That brings it back to your argument. Okay, and then the intended audience. Is his subjects. And he uses powerful language uh, along with religious vocabulary that they would identify with. Turn, accept his authority. So, starting to make a little bit more sense, you're seeing the structure and the layout kind of formulate before your eyes. I hope that that's the case. Okay, so you have. Document number five, I'm going to let you guys do that one 
on your own. Document number five is right up here. And which one was it? I can't remember. Oh yeah, that one was about the Qing dynasty. Okay. Then after you get done writing document five, you're going to write your next topic sentence, make a new paragraph. That one will be your similarity, similarity of force, the use of force. And then you'll use document one and document four. I also need to fix that word. There we go. Now, at the very end, what you can do is reword your thesis so that if you didn't get it in the beginning, you might get it in the end. So you can do that at the very end. But you don't really need a conclusion paragraph. Okay. So what you need to do is document five and then write the next paragraph, document one and four. We've already pretty much got it laid out. So use that layout just like I did for this paragraph. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap this thing up? Has everybody gotten this so that I can delete it for the next peeps? Hopefully you did. Let me know if you haven't, if you're still writing any of this. All right. Great work tonight, Fardine and Tobena. Thank you so much for participating. And um, let's see who else I have in here. Coffee. Thank you. And Adam was here for a little while. Um, I hope that this really helped. And I hope it starts to kind of like clear some things up about the DBQ. Once you get that layout done and you're able to analyze your documents, the DBQ pretty much writes itself. So just use that same structure every time. Describe, support, explain. If you're not going to explain it, that's fine. Oh, and there's one more thing you got to put in here is your outside evidence. Your outside evidence can go anywhere, really. Um, I would suggest maybe writing about feudalism and the divine right of kings. You could do that here. You could do um, it all the way at the end. Uh, so, Farting, it's usually going to be five paragraphs because you're usually going to have your context and thesis. And then normally three body, uh, yeah, so four, about four. Um, normally three body paragraphs because normally we're going to have more documents and you would have a set of three groups versus just two like we had tonight. Okay, so you'll see that next week when we have seven documents. And then your very last paragraph could just be your thesis reworded, especially if you put your outside evidence somewhere within your uh, DBQ. If you're going to put your outside evidence at the very end, that's fine too. You know, you could say um, more outside evidence that supports this argument is blah, 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 blah. Okay. So you have a couple of things to do. You're going to do document five to finish up this paragraph. And then you are going to do documents one and four for your next paragraph. Don't forget to throw some outside evidence in there. Uh, yeah, this one would be three. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, guys, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for joining. And don't forget about the rest of the amazing race. Hopefully you've got the other one finished or close to being finished and you can start working on this one. Keep up the hard work. I know it's taxing. I know this is a lot of information, but it will pay off. I promise you when you get to that AP exam, you will be so glad that you put in this hard work. All right, guys, have a great night. See you later. Bye, Tabana. Bye, Fardine. Have a good one.